Welcome everyone to the Learning Loop Podcast, your best source for educational insights and trends. I'm Chris, your host, and today's special guest is also a Chris, but the Chris from Daily STEM. He strives to provide educators and families with simple STEM resources that connect the real world and learning together and build thinkers of the future. Go to dailystem.com to see all of the amazingness that Chris has to offer. We can't wait anymore to get started. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Chris. Really happy to be here. I, I love hearing about Seesaw. I love uh, hearing about that family engagement piece. I think STEM is, is perfect for getting more parents and families involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. We cannot wait to hear all about this here in just a minute. I want to open up with just a basic question here. So mm -hmm. thinking back to when you first started as an educator, what really built your passion for STEM instruction? You know, when I first started as an educator, I, I was working with kids that struggled. I was working with kids that didn't always love being in class. Uh, as a high school math teacher, you hear that question, why do we have to learn this stuff anyway? And for me, it was about trying to combat that question. I wanted to get to the end of the year and those kids to stop asking that question because they knew. And, and that's a lot of why I brought STEM into my classroom. I looked for ways to make things relevant. I looked for ways to make things hands-on. And, and I found that as I did that, the kids got more excited, they got more engaged, and, and then the learning uh, really started to blossom. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Coming from that personal experience, what do you want mm -hmm. kids to leave education with? And I think more that you, you want to really instill in them, and you kind of said this, is more that lifelong learning. Like, this is mm -hmm. why you want to learn. This is why you want to get better and how you continue to put all those pieces together. Um, mm -hmm. I love that that's your, your back-end mindset with everything you do. Yeah. And, and as an educator, you know, I mean, you may think, well, STEM is complicated. You may think it's technical, it's rocket science, it's robots, it's 3D printing. And yes, it is. Um, you know, I, I came from an engineering background. I started in college in engineering, uh, but switched to become a teacher and, and best decision of my life, you know, outside of getting married and having kids. But um, <laughs> best decision of, of my career uh, to, to help kids to be able to see all those practical applications that I come with. But yet every educator has those practical experiences. They can bring in those things that they're doing in their everyday life to connect that STEM to, to cooking, connect it to uh, different things that kids are doing at home and going for a walk and playing games and playing sports. There's so many of those connections. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Making those explicit connections and getting them to see the benefits of working through that is so important. I want to ask you a question on the same lines as, you know, thinking broader than maybe just helping those students just to see what's happening. What other benefits do students get when they really get to experience STEM instruction on a routine basis as they work through their entire year? Yeah, to get get kids on that that routine basis of STEM, where you know, yeah, you can't do a big project all the time, but you can uh, throw in a five minute demo. You can show in a, a quick two or three minute video in a class. It's about making it relevant. It's showing the kids that it does connect. Uh, that subject isn't just a standalone idea. It connects cross-curricular. Yeah. It connects to uh, the history that they're learning, you know, in a different class or in social studies. Or um, it connects to even their literacy. Uh, when you're when you're building something, when you're uh, creating something, that engineering design process is a lot like writing a rough draft and revising it, and then making that final draft. And so those skills that they learn in in STEM learning they transfer to to so many other things. The other aspect that I love about uh, building STEM in is that opportunity for career connection. Yeah. And there's so many different ways, you know, even again, through just a quick video, uh, a quick uh, guest speaker that maybe zooms into your classroom even mm -hmm. that can show those kids, hey, this is how we're using these things for amazing careers. Uh, that could be a huge piece that a lot of educators are missing out on. Absolutely. So many powerful examples you just shared there around videos and recordings and even just drafting and other things too. I, I want to just ask you a question around how to really collect all that information. You know, we here at Seesaw, we, we love digital portfolios. We're a digital portfolio mm -hmm. platform, but what right. ways have you found teachers, uh, what benefits, I guess, do they get around using a digital portfolio combined with STEM instruction? Yeah, it's, it's easy to maybe show a video this year and then, you know, here you are a year from now and you're like, oh, what was that one video I showed? Or, or here's a project that I did and now a year from now you're thinking, boy, it would be great to have 
some examples to show my students that maybe are struggling, some of those kids that, that just can't quite get the concept. And if I could show them a video, show them an example, uh, and that's where that, that recording, that, uh, that process of making a digital portfolio can be uh, super helpful. Uh, for me, you know, because I'm, I'm high school, I'm not, not really using Seesaw all the time. You know, I'm, I'm just making playlists in YouTube, yeah. um, which, is, which is a super simple tip for every educator. If you've got a Google account, you've got a YouTube account and, and just use that. Add those things to playlists, create ones that are uh, career videos, create ones that are for each subject or each chapter. Uh, that could be simple ways to do that. And again, those are things you could do in, in Seesaw as well. Mm -hmm. uh, those ways that you can, again, uh, transfer things that you did last year that worked to next year, um, which, you know, it's easy to forget. We get we get so busy with so many other things and all of a sudden, you know, here we're doing a topic in class and going, uh-oh, I remember doing this last year. We should have We should have done that this year. So, yeah. So much. And really looking back at that growth too, beyond that of just mm -hmm. kind of seeing what we did and how we did it, we can actually see how much we've grown in our accomplishments over those years as well. Um, yeah. A lot of a lot of educators, especially STEM educators, like using that idea of of a, a STEM journal. You yeah. know, something where kids can can write down ideas of things that they want to keep learning about or or ideas and projects, designs, uh, pictures, ideas and and having those things all in one spot. And we know kids can lose things if they have a, a paper portfolio, a paper journal. Yeah. But if you could if you could make something digital and they have access to that year after year after year and they could see those projects that they made in third grade, in sixth grade and eighth grade, they're going to be able to see some tremendous growth in, in what they're doing and able to do. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. And, and I will say, too, you know, those those journals and those paper copies, too, those can also showcase growth as you continue yeah. to go through the year. Uh, a, a digital portfolio is just one piece of the puzzle that really showcases this entire picture of what a student has and understands as well. Yeah. Um, you reference a couple quick technology things, and I want to ask you a question on those lines, because in the word STEM, T is stands for technology. We all know this. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. What role does technology play when you think about your STEM activities and, and how does that really shape the way that you uh, potentially even like measure student performance and provide in instruction to your students in your classroom? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, Chris, has to depend on the subject, mm -hmm. uh, the content, the lesson. If, if we try to always, you know, shoehorn ideas into a particular technology, Yep. then then you know that's not going to benefit the kids and and really that's going to make things more complicated for us so yeah. so finding that great way to integrate it that that great way to meld those two things together you know we may really like cheese we really may like salmon but if you try putting those two together you know that's just not going to taste very well so it's finding those correct ways those best ways to use it so so if i'm using uh, maybe tinkercad uh, mm -hmm. to design something you know in my science class you know i can have the kids be able to, uh, you know, uh, design uh, all the planets in in the solar system, you know, by different sizes, you know, because we can make those spheres and make them different sizes. They could change the colors, that label them and everything like that. Uh, or I can have them get out paint and get out, you know, the styrofoam balls and, and paint them and uh, and things like that. Uh, both are great. Both provide kids with that, that hands-on experience. And, and it's important, I think, that, that we really balance that, that we, that we say, I, I want to have that technology piece and I want to show kids that, that you know, tech, you know, free, that, you know, that, that off the screen, that uh, tangible, tangible idea right in front of me as well. So finding the best ways to use the best of both worlds is, mm -hmm. is probably the best uh, use of technology. Absolutely. And you, you didn't explicitly say it, but I'll also kind of add in that you're talking about providing access to for students who maybe um, are, are suffering from a disability or maybe are mm -hmm. trying to learn a new language or maybe just need to provide a little bit more equitable opportunity. Uh, you're also speaking to that too of just kind of how you can cater and custom STEM instruction and how, uh, how, how student-led that can be as you go through mm -hmm. the entire year. So I absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah, that differentiation is is so uh, critical, so crucial, and and finding those ways to to help each kid because, 
you know, face it, if you and I were to, you know, to compete in some sort of a cooking challenge or some type of a, you know, woodworking challenge, our skills would be at much different levels. But if we yeah. both got to be by the end of, you know, a cooking class or a carpentry class, if our skills both increased, yeah. uh, then there was progress for both of us. And, and how important that is for every kid in our classroom, whether they're using a hot glue gun, whether they're uh, attaching nuts and bolts together, or whether they're creating something in Google Slides or Tinkercad or, or any type of software. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. And I love your example, too, of ensuring that we're, we're growing, ensuring we're yeah. moving forward, because that's really all that matters as educators, yeah. as students, and even as parents and family members. You know, we just want people to move forward in the way that they're yeah. going. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that can happen at home too, you know, yeah. like, yeah. so like a, a virtual, you know, a, a technology piece, you know, that's something that, that families can, can engage with. And, you know, I think a lot of parents think, you know, well, the kids are on a screen, I'm just going to let them be on a screen, but, you know, have those kids, you know, show you what they're doing, what they're making, say, Hey, show me how to use this Tinkercad thing. I've, I've heard you talking about, or show me how, you know, this other piece of technology works. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd love to do that with you. Uh, that's a great thing that a mom or a dad, a grandparent, anybody can do. Absolutely. I want to lean into that a little bit further, this family connection piece that you're talking through, because <laughs> we at Seesaw, we we super value family connection and having them be involved in the learning. What other ways and what other benefits have you seen from having families be a part of this learning and really help to move that learning forward, even at home? Yeah, I, I can tell you that, that a lot of times this happens, Chris, at um, at STEM nights, uh, mm -hmm. which a lot of schools are starting to do. They're realizing, you know, hey, that old science fair thing that we used to do, let's let's rework it. Let's let's transform it into something that's that's very hands on where it's not just the parent doing the project at home, yeah. which we knew a lot of kids did. Um, but having parents and kids showing up together mm -hmm. and, and to, to do something where they're where they're both creating a project, where they're both exploring or investigating or using a microscope, using some um, th some things like that. And, and when parents, uh, find out that, that they can be learners right alongside their, their kids, uh, that's, that's incredibly powerful for them, but also for their kids. Um, it, I love, I love finding those, those opportunities. Uh, a lot of schools are starting to do that. If you're, if you're a school and you haven't done a STEM night, you know, reach out to another neighboring district, neighboring school and ask them, Hey, what worked, what, it, what didn't work or ask, Ask me, ask Chris, you know, we'll both be able to share some, some great ideas of things we've seen. Um, but then also too, educators, if you're, if you're sending home a weekly newsletter or you have some sort of a website or some sort of, uh, something that you share with parents, share a couple of ideas each week, say, you know, Hey, here's a, here's a fun project you could do with your kids. It connects a little bit with what we did this week in class. Um, you know, here's a couple of in simple ingredients that you would need, some cardboard, some, you know, baking soda. I mean, we know all those typical types of things. Or just remind parents, go for a walk and, you know, count if you're a little kindergarten class, you know, count how many birds you see, how many different dogs you see. Um, look at the houses, look at the angles of the roof. Um, any type of thing that can just kind of reinforce that, get that learning to happen at home. Uh, it doesn't have to be complex. It can be, uh, but it's just, it's just a matter of just uh, being together and, and getting, getting families learning together. Absolutely. And getting them to feel empowered to be a learner as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. such a such an amazing experience to share together with families and students and everybody as they continue learning, whether it's at home, in the car, or on a walk, mm -hmm. wherever you need to. Uh, yeah. Absolutely love it. Yeah. We have just a couple more questions, and I really want to ask you uh, this next one. What has been or is your absolute favorite STEM activity that you've ever done? Uh, have you ever taught and why was it your favorite? Yeah, this is an easy question for me, Chris. Uh, years ago, I, I, uh, I taught a hands-on geometry class mm -hmm. and just one for kids that's really struggled with. I mean, I'm sure a lot of listeners are thinking, oh, I remember proofs. I remember how difficult that was to figure out the right one, the right steps, the right order. So we made a, a geometry that was very hands-on and uh, a lot of formulas, a lot of the area perimeter surface area, volume, 3D shapes, all those kinds of things. And so one thing I, I had uh, kids do was just trace their shoe. And and so we did it on graph paper and I said, okay, count up the full squares, count up the partial squares. That gave them kind of an estimate of the area because we think of area, we often just think of rectangles, circles, yeah. triangles, those standard shapes. So here we're getting an area of a very irregular shape. And one of the kids says, hey, Mr. Woods, can we, can we try making some shoes? And I was like, 
well, why not? And it's like, got out some paper, got out some cardboard, some construction paper, glue tape, everything. And I said, all right, try making some shoes. Yeah. And I tell you what, uh, it wasn't planned, uh, but it turned out to be a, a great project, a great challenge. Kids had to persevere through it. Uh, and each year as I did it, uh, kids just uh, did incredible things. Each year as I showed them examples of previous years, uh, yeah. projects, they wanted to, oh, I want to do that, or I want to make it even better. Um, and and then even to the fact that that later on in the year when we were doing surface area and volume, they had a much better grasp on it because yeah. uh, they had actually had to build something that they thought would be really easy to build. Yeah, but but that 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 transferring from two D to three D, great, yeah. so powerful. I love it, and I love too that the student said like, well, why can't we do? Like, can we do this? Yeah. They, they could yeah. ask for permission yeah. and. You know, granting that sometimes as a teacher and releasing that responsibility or that, we'll say, power uh, can be yep. hard, but the benefits that you experience sometimes when you do that are tremendous. They far outweigh yep. the pressure and in the, the anxiety that might come with that at times. Yeah. And I've seen educators, because I've shared those pictures and stuff on social media, and I've yep. seen pictures uh, of, of teachers doing it with you know second graders, fifth mm-hmm. graders, eighth graders, high schoolers. And, and they're all uh, making uh, incredible things. And um, it's definitely a, a very uh, wide range of skills that can make those types of things. And if you're doing circuitry, you know, add some copper tape and some LEDs. If you're uh, talking about prosthetics, you can, you know, or if you think about what's the softest shoe, you be, there's so many things you can adjust and modify. And those are the best STEM projects that you can you can make fit any type of thing that you're learning. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Such a practical project for anybody who's listening just to take away right now. Yeah. We have two more questions and I'm going to ask this one next, which is our loopy question. This is just a silly yep. question. We ask everybody who's here. Are you a salty treat person or are you a sweet treat person? Can I say both, Chris? <laughs> you, you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love love some chips, and uh, but yet I just ate some brownies uh, end of the school day. Uh, they're they're both good. I, I sometimes I sometimes I I don't eat enough salt, believe it or not, and so um, so I have to make sure I eat some chips now and then to do that. How about you, Chris? Well, there you go. I, I would lean more on salty for me personally. Yeah. I like yeah. a really savory snack, something that uh, you know you can kind of munch on and then be done for the day. But I know that uh, having both, there's nothing wrong with that too. So you might've spurred a new idea in my head here as it goes. (laughs) All right. Final question here. Uh, There might be listeners here who are new to teaching. They might be new to STEM instruction. They may be new to Uh really anything in education in general. What one or two things would you tell to this teacher for some advice, some quick next steps uh, for them to Mm -hmm. just get started with improving their STEM Mm -hmm. instruction in their school? Yeah, so important, Chris. Uh, a lot of educators think, again, I don't. I have to be maybe some sort of rocket scientist or some uh, high tech individual to to do STEM, and you don't. Uh, so, so number one, just just try something. The kids are going to be better for it. You're going to enjoy it. The kids are going to get to make a little noise, have a little fun, make some mess, and uh, they'll they'll also be able to make something with with their hands. Uh, and and one of the best ideas uh, came from a friend of mine, Liz Gallo. Uh, who works with educators, and and she said, uh, copy, change, uh, and create. And 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 if you see a project out there, you're like, I can copy that. I can do that with my kids. Uh, and after a little while, you're going to start to realize you can change it. You can adjust it for your classroom to make it even better for for your kids, uh, your community. And then eventually, you're going to be creating your own. And and that's that's that ultimate goal. But you don't have to start out with creating your own project. Find somebody else's project. Look for them. There's so many ideas out there. Uh, if you need some ideas, you know, I mean, we've we've both got ideas. Uh, um, we're we're happy to help if if anybody's got any, any questions. Absolutely love it, Chris. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you listen, if you want to get some quick ideas, you can always go to dailystem.com. Uh, Chris is your expert out here. Is providing so many practical things out here. Thanks for taking time out of your day to share a little bit about how STEM instruction is happening around you and how STEM instruction can really have a positive impact in every student's academic careers. We so appreciate it. Hey, I really appreciate it, Chris, and uh, keep up the great work, all you and, and everybody there at Seesaw. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye.